Uh, dear colleagues, uh, it's really a great pleasure to welcome Tim Corevar to this audience today. Uh, Tim is a young MD resident in internal medicine, PhD in endocrinology, who also holds a master's degree in clinical epidemiology. His studies were conducted at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and he has spent time as visiting scientist or clinical fellow in Harvard Medical School and at the Chelsea Hospital in London. He has received an impressive number of awards uh, and has over 100 publications. His main interests are on thyroid function, particularly during pregnancy, and how it impacts on maternal and child health. Uh, he is an incredible dynamic researcher, keen to establish networks that maximize the information available worldwide, as is the case for the Consortium on Thyroid and Pregnancy. Dear Tim, thank you very much for accepting to be a lecturer today in this International Seminar Series Encounter. We hope to have the chance to receive you in presence very soon. The stage is yours, thank you. Thanks very much for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, as we briefly discussed two minutes ago, I think we uh, do not only share our enthusiasm for thyroid and pregnancy, but we also share some uh, feelings of grief after losing in the football match yesterday, both our countries, unfortunately. Um, so let me just uh, share my screen. There we go. Um, I thought it would be good today just to um, provide a clinical update on the management of thyroid diseases in pregnancy. And um, I also understood there will be some time for discussion. So I look forward to that as well. Um, I wanted to just start with a brief introduction and then talk about diagnosing an abnormal thyroid function, particularly subclinical hypothyroidism, discuss the role of especially TPO antibodies, and then also go into the concept of overtreatment because I do think that there's some new data that can help us to better uh, assess the risk of overtreatment or to just establish that there is in fact a risk of overtreatment when we treat with levothyroxine in pregnancy. Um, and then I would also like to give a brief update on managing Graves hyperthyroidism. So thyroid function in pregnancy undergoes major changes because there is pregnancy specific physiological changes that occur and impact thyroid physiology. And here you can see a timeline which goes from conception on the left all the way up to birth on the right. And we know that there is actually three factors that can limit thyroid hormone availability in maternal serum. First of all, there's an increase in thyroxine binding globulin. There's also placental transfer of maternal thyroid hormones to the fetal compartment. And on top of that, the placenta also inactivates thyroid hormone because it expresses the type 3 diiodinase. And type 3 diiodinase inactivates thyroid hormone because it actually changes T4 to reverse T3 and T3 to T2. Um, and on top of that, uh, there's also an increased clearance in iodine, uh, which also complicates the production of thyroid hormones. Now, luckily for us humans, there is um, HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin, uh, which is of course a very well-known pregnancy specific hormone that has a, is very much like TSH on the molecular level and therefore is able to bind to the TSH receptor. And high concentrations of HCG during pregnancy actually cause an increase in free T4 because of this TSH receptor stimulation. And because there's an increase in free T4, there's also a decrease in TSH concentration. So the classical TSH dip that peaks um, around the same time as HCG peaks around the end of the first trimester. So if we want to define what is a normal and what's an abnormal thyroid function, these changes in thyroid physiology complicate the interpretation of thyroid function tests. So we can't really interpret TSH and free T4 concentrations in a similar manner as we would do outside of pregnancy using those reference ranges. 
And for a very long time, the American Thyroid Association guidelines, for example, have advocated the use of an upper limit of TSH or two, of two and a half or three milliunits per liter to diagnose hypothyroidism and subclinical hypothyroidism in pregnancy. But here you can see some data from uh, recent meta-analyses comparing the calculated reference ranges. So those are lab-specific reference ranges that are calculated for a local population, which is basically the gold standard, to the uh, ATA guideline recommendations using a two and a half or three million per liter cutoff, and to the more recent fixed upper limit um, recommendations, which is a TSH of four million per liter. And I'll get back to that in my next slide. And what this paper really clearly showed is that there is a lot of overdiagnosis if we still use a TSH of two and a half or three millions per liter to diagnose hypothyroidism. So as you can see on the left, we diagnose over double the number of women um, if we would use two and a half or three millions per liter as compared to the gold standard, which would lead to overdiagnosis in one in 120 women. And for subclinical hypothyroidism, this is much larger. So there you can see that on average, the prevalence would go up from three and a half to about 14 and a half percent, which is of course not a number that is something that um, we can really expect um, because we know for a fact that not 14% of all pregnant women really have an abnormal thyroid function. Um, so there's considerable overdiagnosis there. One in nine women would actually be overdiagnosed with subclinical hypothyroidism. Um, but what you can see is that if you would raise this upper limit to four millionits per liter, this overdiagnosis of both hypothyroidism and subclinical hypothyroidism is considerably decreased. So this is also the reason why the current American Thyroid Association guidelines, which I show here on the left of my slide, um, recommend the following. And that is that still the gold standard would be to calculate reference ranges for your own center. Um, but if those are unavailable, and this is, of course, the case for most hospitals worldwide, you can use a reference range that has been calculated in a hospital that uses the same TSH assay and um, has been um, calculated in a similar population. And if this is still unavailable, which again is still probably the case for the majority of hospitals worldwide, then a fixed upper limit of TSH could be used. Uh, which would typically be four millionits per liter. So the reason that I mentioned these ATA guidelines is because the ATA guidelines are the ones that are the most up-to-date until now. And there are still a lot of data coming out on reference ranges. And it's probably going to change again in another five years. Um, but this is the, probably the best recommendation that we have currently based on the data that we have currently. Now, there's still use of a TSH of 2.5 as a cutoff in pregnancy. Um, and that is if we monitor women who are using levothyroxine. So we shouldn't use two and a half or three milliunits per liter to diagnose hypothyroidism or subclinical hypothyroidism, but it is still a relevant number to use as a treatment target for women who use levothyroxine during pregnancy. Because during pregnancy, we want the TSH to be normal but by ensuring that with treatment, the TSH is below two and a half, the increased demand for thyroid hormone production that these women probably can't meet um, is anticipated on by having a slightly lower TSH than the upper limit. Um, and therefore you decrease the risk of under treatment. So from that point of view in women who are treated with levothyroxine, it would still make sense to try and treat them to a TSH below two and a half milliunits per liter. So how about um, treating women during pregnancy based on newly diagnosed thyroid dysfunction? Well, here again, you can see what the American Thyroid Association guidelines are recommending for that. Um, when there um, is a TSH above 10 milliunits per liter, there's always an indication to start levothyroxine treatment. But for the other categories that you can see on this slide, it's split up based on the TPO antibody status. So in women who do not have TPO antibodies, um, women with a normal TSH 
obviously do not have a treatment indication as is indicated by the green part of this slide. Um, but when the TSH is above the upper limit, but below 10 millionits per liter, we really don't have good enough data to recommend for or against treatment. So in this case, I've made it gray because it's a bit of a gray zone. And the guidelines basically say that you can consider to start levothyroxine treatment in this group. For TPO antibody positive women, these treatment indications are a bit shifted. In those women, actually, we say, for a TSH that's above the upper limit. There is a treatment indication. So there, there is an indication to start levothyroxine treatment. But this gray zone is a bit different for TPO antibody positive women because it's between two and a half and the upper limit of TSH in this case. So there are considerable differences when you can consider to start levothyroxine treatment. But then there's also these, these um, very large uh, proportions of women who fall within these gray category um, parts of these recommendations. And there, it's really, you know, a good conversation with the woman and your clinical uh, considerations that would determine whether or not to, st to start levothyroxine treatment. Now, especially this different approach in TPO antibody positive women is quite new. So I wanted to just go into that in a bit more detail. Here on the right part of the slide, you can see some data from our group where we looked in two prospective cohort studies to the association of HCG and 3T4. Because of the physiology I just mentioned, we would expect that HCG stimulates the TSH receptor and therefore increases the 3T4 concentration. And you can see that that's definitely the case in the uh, TPO antibody negative women on the left part, higher HCG equals a higher 3T4. But we found that in the TPO antibody positive women, actually there is probably a reduced thyroid functional capacity. So with increased stimulation during pregnancy with the higher HCG concentrations in TPO antibody positive women, we don't see a higher 3T4 concentration. And that will probably equate to what you see in the left part of my slide. And that is that TPO antibody positive women don't have this increase in 3T4 concentrations during early pregnancy and probably have a much more flatter curve in 3T4 concentrations throughout pregnancy and also a lower area under the curve. Now, there's also a translation that can be made to clinical consequences of TPO antibody positivity. And what's interesting is that if you look at that data, there seems to be this suggestion of a synergistically higher risk in the combination of thyroid autoimmunity with a high TSH concentration. So this was the first study that actually showed that from China, looking at the risk of miscarriage. And here you can see that women who had a TSH above two and a half or above the upper limit in that specific lab, which was 5.2, seem to have a higher risk of miscarriage. Women with thyroid autoimmunity, in this case, it was TPO antibody positivity especially, also had a higher risk of miscarriage. But then when they started to look at this group of women who had both TPO antibodies and a TSH above either 2.5 or above their reference range cutoff, that's where the risk of miscarriage really started to increase. So again, this seems to implicate that there is a higher risk with the combination of TPO antibodies and a high or even a high normal TSH concentration. Unfortunately, we also have data from a randomized controlled trial it was performed in Iran by the group of Peridun Azizi, and it was split into, again, T2 antibody negative and T2 antibody positive women. And what was really interesting about this specific um, randomized controlled trial is that they started levothyroxine treatment already in the 12th week of pregnancy, so quite early on, and subclinical hypothyroidism was actually still defined according to the older TSH cutoffs. So the two and a half, three millionits per liter. And what was interesting is that when you look at both the TPO antibody negative and TPO antibody positive women, the risk of miscarriage was only lower in the women who were treated and were TPO antibody positive. So you can see in the bottom of my slide, this risk uh, decreased from about 24% to 
But if you look in the upper part, you can see that preterm delivery risk didn't decrease in the TPO antibody negative group. But what was perhaps even more interesting is that when they looked at a TSH of four milliunits per liter, rather than using the older cutoffs of two and a half and three milliunits per liter, the women that were below four milliunits per liter actually didn't have any benefit of levothyroxine treatment because their preterm delivery risk didn't change. But when you look at the women who had a TSH above four, whether or not they were TPO antibody negative or TPO antibody positive, that's where the main effect of treatment was seen. So that's where levothyroxine treatment lowered the risk of preterm delivery. And this was decreased from 19 to about 7% in the TPO antibody negative group and from about 29 to 5%, so a much larger effect in the TPO antibody positive women. So very interesting trial. It was still quite a small trial with about 60 women in each arm, um, but it really showed very large effects from, from um, what is it, quite a well-known group in Iran from Faridun Azizi. There has also been two other large randomized controlled trials, of course, in this field. First one is the CATS trial, and the other one is the trial by the Americans, by NIH and Brian Casey. And what was really interesting is that actually in these larger trials, there weren't any beneficial effects of levothyroxine seen. So here you can see the results of the CATS trial on the top of the slide. In the CATS trial, women with subclinical hypothyroidism or hypothyroxinemia were treated with 150 micrograms of levothyroxine, so quite a high dose. And they started at the median of 16 weeks pregnancy. Now, the main outcome of that trial was child IQ. And you can see that the mean IQ wasn't different between the placebo and the treatment group at all. But also when they looked at other outcomes, so miscarriage, preeclampsia, preterm birth and birth weight, those were all similar between the groups. The trial from the Americans was slightly different. Here, women with subclinical hypothyroidism uh, were randomized to receive a placebo or 100 micrograms of levothyroxine and those with hypothyroxinemia, um, if they were treated, were treated with 50 micrograms of levothyroxine. But the start of treatment in this trial was even later. So in this trial, actually up to 22 weeks pregnancy, women could be included and started on levothyroxine. Um, but the median start of treatment was around 17 to 18 weeks. Here, they did actually find a small difference in child IQ in favor of the levothyroxine group, so about three points, but this was not statistically significant. And that particularly had to do with the fact that they were only statistically powered to show a five-point difference as being statistically significant here. Uh, whereas actually in most prospective studies, we do see a three-point IQ difference in the children when we compare, for example, women with hypothyroxinemia to youth thyroid women. So that's really unfortunate from this trial. Now, I think it's really important that we have these trials, but on the other hand, it's also really important that we interpret the results in the correct way and that we value these trials correctly. Because there is two important concepts that we really need to mention when we look at the results of these trials. And the first one is overtreatment, and the second one is the timing of treatment. So with regards to overtreatment, it's important to realize that if you look at this timeline from conception on the left to birth on the right, in humans, neurogenesis doesn't start until week five of pregnancy, but the fetal thyroid is not fully functional until about 20 weeks of pregnancy. So that means that between week five and week 20 of pregnancy, the brain developmental processes that are stimulated by thyroid hormone. So that's predominantly the differentiation and migration and the proliferation of neuronal cells is actually dependent on the placental transfer of maternal thyroid hormones. So this means that there is an important window of opportunity during which re-establishing euthyroidism in women with thyroid disease may be beneficial when it comes to brain development of the child. So here again, if you look at the, the slide I just showed you, but then just for the CATS trial where they treated with 150 micrograms, 
it's interesting if you um, put in the same slide also this summary of what mainly our group, but also other groups have found for the association in prospective cohort studies. Because actually in prospective cohort studies, what we have found is that maternal TSH and 3T4 actually have this inverted U-shaped association with outcomes that are related to early brain development. So that is IQ of the child during later life, or as we have done in Rotterdam, um, look at MRI scans of the children when they are about six to 10 years of age. Because when we looked at child IQ or at the gray matter or the cortex volume at about 2000 child MRI scans at the age of 10, we found that both low thyroid function and high thyroid function were associated with suboptimal outcomes. So lower gray matter and lower child IQ. So you can imagine that if you treat a woman with a very high dose of levothyroxine, you could potentially also treat her to the high thyroid function part of this graph and do not then not have any net benefit of levothyroxine treatment. And with this concept in mind, the investigators from the CATS trial actually followed up some of these children from the trial and they then did additional testing at the age of nine. And they actually found that in the children of the mothers who had a high 3T4 in the treatment group, there was actually much more ADHD and also more behavioral problems. Now they didn't find any difference in child IQ, but also ADHD and behavioral problems could of course be seen as a consequence of suboptimal brain development. For example, through fetal programming uh, mechanisms, for example. So from this has come this concept that there is a potential for treatment and that what we want to strive for is the graph on the left where we treat a woman with low thyroid function to the middle of the normal range. Um, and we want to overcome the scenario that's on the right where we treat a woman with a high dose and we actually pass the upper part of this graph and we lower or we actually reduce fully the any net benefit effect, potential benefit effect of treatment. So from these data and also from some other data, the recommendation has come to start a low dose of levothyroxine therapy for women who have mild thyroid dysfunction. So if you decide to treat a woman who has T2 antibody positivity and a TSH above two and a half, so is in the gray zone, or who has subclinical hypothyroidism, but not T2 antibody positivity, start with 50 micrograms a day and check TSH and free T4 later to make sure that you don't over or under treat. Now, the second thing I think is important to realize when you interpret randomized trials is the timing. So here you can see some of the data um, of those MRI scans that we had from Rotterdam. So this was a prospective cohort study in little under 2000 mothers, mother and child pairs, where thyroid function testing was done in the first 18 weeks of pregnancy. And then MRIs of these children um, were made um, at the age of 10 years. And we replicated the results of a previous study, but we also for the first time found a similar association for TSH concentrations, as I mentioned before, but we now for the first time, because we had such a large sample, were able to look at differences throughout gestational age. And what we actually found was that TSH concentrations measured at eight, 10, or 12 weeks pregnancy showed the exact same pattern as we saw before. So this inverted U-shaped association showing that both lower and higher TSH concentrations of the mother are associated with lower cortex volume and lower brain mass in the brain of the child postnatally. But you can also see that in week 14, 16, and 18, this line actually starts to flatten out. So after about week 14, didn't see any association at all in this data set. And probably that has to do also with the fact or that can also be translated to how we should interpret these randomized controlled trials. So from the CATS trial, actually, when you look at this physiological time window of brain development and fetal requirements for the placental transfer of maternal thyroid hormones, that is red box 
actually in the CATS trial, you can see that they did treat all the women within this time window. Um, but in that study, like I mentioned, they treated with a too high dose. Whereas in the NIH trial, you can see that for many women, there's hardly any overlap with this physiological time window anymore. So perhaps what we have learned from these trials is that we shouldn't shoot at mild thyroid disease in pregnancy with a huge cannon with 150 micrograms because we may overtreat women. Whereas we may have learned from the American trial that if you do treat with a lower dose, but you only start at about 18 weeks of pregnancy, we're probably too late with treatment. And that's of course from the perspective of wanting to normalize brain developmental parameters again, of course. Now, unfortunately, also what's important for these trials is that they didn't split up the associations or the um, analysis that they performed for birth outcomes, especially preterm births of interest there for TPO antibody positivity versus TPO antibody negative women. So there's also some work still to be done there. Um, so that was the first part of, uh, of the talk that I wanted to provide, which mainly focused on subclinical hypothyroidism and TPO antibody positivity and how we should interpret the data that we have and what the current um, reasons are behind the recommendations for starting treatment. And now for the second part of this talk, I would just want to briefly switch to Graves' disease um, and provide some new concepts for managing women with Graves' disease during pregnancy as well. So um, this is a very typical case that many of you may see. Um, and I don't think that we need to really go into the uh, question principle because it's uh, online and everything. But if you just read through this case, you can see it's a 32 year old lady who's trying to conceive and she's been diagnosed with Graves' disease. And she really wants to become pregnant quickly. So then the question very often is, you know, what are you going to do? Will you be starting methimazole? Will you be starting PTU? Do you start block and replace therapy? Or do you want to go for a more titration based scheme to try and lower the dose? Or would you go for a thyroidectomy or even radioactive iodine? Well, of course, radioactive iodine is, is very difficult in women who are trying to conceive, but there are arguments for and against all of these other options. So one of the things that are important to communicate about thinking about risk in terms of PTU and methimazole, which is of course associated, as you may know, with a slightly higher risk of fetal birth defects, is first of all, the absolute risk difference that we know of. So when you look at studies from Denmark and from Korea, which are the main studies looking at um, methimazole and PTU associated fetal birth defects, the absolute risk increase isn't that large. It's only about 3% for PTU and 5% for methimazole. But what we do see in those studies is that the birth defects that are typically associated with PTU are less severe. So this goes from you know, hydronephrosis to a preauricular sinus or cyst to, for example, an uh, omphalocele for methimazole. And because there is a slightly lower absolute risk for PTU and the defects typically are less severe, PTU for the treatment of Graves' disease in women who want to become pregnant or are pregnant mm -hmm. is really the preferred drug currently. There's one additional argument that comes from this very good Korean study, because in that study, they were able to look also at the risk according to the cumulative dosage in the first trimester of PTU and methimazole. And when they compared the lowest to the highest cumulative dosage of PTU, they actually didn't find a difference in the risk of fetal birth defects. But when they did this for methimazole, they actually did find that women with a higher cumulative dosage of methimazole in the first trimester did have a higher risk of fetal birth defects. So the lack of cumulative dose response effects for PTU is another argument why you should try and favor PTU in women who need to be treated for Graves' disease around or during pregnancy. 
Another important question is then, of course, well, what if uh, my patient calls me up and says, I've been on methimazole for the last couple of months, and now I just had a positive pregnancy test. What do I need to do? Is there any benefit of switching her from methimazole to PT once she's already pregnant? And the answer to that is no. So in this Korean study, they also had a small group of women where they could look at those who switched from methimazole to PT in the first trimester or those who continued on methimazole during the first trimester. And actually, there wasn't any difference in the risk of uh, fetal birth defects, implicating that there's no benefit of switching. And of course, on the other hand, switching always comes with the risk of biochemical deterioration. You never really know if that switch um, will be uh, in the right dose range for that particular patient. So then you have the risk of biochemical deterioration and hyperthyroidism. One other important consideration for trying to overcome fetal birth defects um, according to antithyroid drugs is also that you can sometimes try and stop a low dose of PTU or methimazole upon a positive pregnancy test. And the idea of this, I've tried to grasp in this figure here. So we all know that the teratogenic period is mainly between six to 12 weeks or you know, probably between week five to 16 weeks, there's a higher risk. And in some women who have a low risk of relapse, it may be possible to stop PTU and methimazole upon a positive pregnancy test. Because we know that when we treat, when we stop, sorry, when we stop antithyroid drugs, it takes about two to three months on average before Graves' disease would relapse, if it relapses at all. Because we also know that when we stop treatment after a while, about 50 to 70% of patients actually don't have a relapse of Graves' disease. And we can use those chances to our advantage by stopping PTU and methimazole early in pregnancy and then following up thyroid function. Because best case scenario, the disease actually doesn't come back. So in 50% of women, we may have stopped it and there isn't any relapse of hypothyroidism associated with that, but we do reduce the risk of antithyroid drug um, fetal birth defects. Or if the hyperthyroidism or the Graves' disease does relapse, it will probably happen after about 12 weeks of pregnancy. So we may be able to bypass that teratogenic period before Graves' disease relapses and we need to start antithyroid drugs again. On top of that, we also know that because of immune modulation, TSH receptor antibodies after about 20 weeks start to decline. So once we are able to get patients with Graves' disease to about 20 weeks pregnancy, that's when the natural decline in these antibody occurs. And also the severity of Graves' disease would already have a natural decline. So if we can make it there, we'll probably be safe from there onwards. Now, we can't do this for all women who are treated for Graves' disease prior or during pregnancy. So we need to make a risk assessment to ensure that the risk of relapse is low. And here you can see some of the um, intuitive, I would say, uh, factors that communicate a low risk of relapse. So it's a treatment duration for at least six months with a normal TSH and a low dose of methimazole or a comparable low dose of PTU. And of course, no signs of severe disease based on high TSH receptor antibody concentrations or eye involvement, for example. But still, a lot of women would probably meet these criteria and you would be able to stop antithyroid drugs early in pregnancy. So the other options that I mentioned um, are also possible, but what I think is important um, about these options is to always communicate the pros and cons of these to the patient so that they can make an informed decision, especially, of course, prior to pregnancy, if we go back to our case. So when it comes to thyroidectomy, of course, the biochemical response is very well. There's certain risk of surgeries 
which shouldn't be neglected. Still about five to 10% of women who have hypoparathyroidism or surgical complications otherwise. And of course, we also shouldn't underestimate the consequences of lifelong levothyroxine, uh, which for some women may be um, more or larger than for other women. Uh, what we do know with thyroidectomy, when you look at the picture on the right, is that the TSH receptor antibodies actually decline, decline quite rapidly. So when you look at the graph on the right, you can see TSH receptor antibody concentrations throughout the years after a certain treatment. And for surgery and for medication, the TSH receptor antibodies go down quite quickly. Now for radioactive iodine, this is different. As you can see, there's first a flare, and then after about one and a half years, you're expected to be at the baseline TSH receptor antibody level. Now, so this means that on top of the contraindication for becoming pregnant based on the radioactive component of the treatment, which is about six months, there's also a relative contraindication, especially for women who have very high TSH receptor antibody concentrations to undergo radioactive iodine if they are planning to become pregnant within the next year or so. Because if they're already high, then of course the radioactive iodine treatment can cause a flare. And if a woman would then become pregnant, there's a much higher risk of fetal hyperthyroidism or neonatal Graves disease if they have received radioactive iodine treatment. So once a woman then is pregnant, how are you going to monitor the child? And, and this is very relevant, of course, especially if you want to stop antithyroid drugs, there's an indication for that. And most of you will know very well that you can monitor the heart rate and the growth and the size of the fetal thyroid uh, using ultrasound measurements. Um, but what's also very important is to monitor the mother. And that's not only to say something about, you know, the biochemical control and the risk of preterm birth and preeclampsia, which are associated with that. But it's also important to monitor the mother in order to monitor the fetus. Because what we actually know, if you look at this graph on the left, is that pregnancy thyroid function measured in the mother is actually very strongly correlated to um, thyroid hormone concentrations in the child. So what we measure in the mother is probably also a good reflection of the thyroid status in the child. And on the right part of this slide, you can see the already very old data, but still very relevant data from the Momotani paper from 1986, where they investigated the neonatal free T4 concentrations in children born from mothers treated for Graves' disease with antithyroid drugs. And here they split up these data into four groups, looking at the maternal free T4, so greater than normal or in the upper third of the normal range or in the lower two thirds of the normal range versus low free T4 concentrations during pregnancy. And on the y-axis, you can see the number of newborns who had hypothyroidism at birth. And what you can see is that if you treat the mother with antithyroid drugs to a free T4 concentration that's lower than normal, or even in the lower two thirds of the normal range, the risk of newborn hypothyroidism is still quite high. So at least 36%. And that's also the reason why the treatment target is set for a free T4 concentration in the mother of the upper third of the normal range. So we want to strive for a high normal free T4 concentration to make sure that we balance out the risks related to hyperthyroidism and the risk related to overtreatment of the child um, causing newborn hypothyroidism. And the reason that we probably need to be a bit in the upper part of the normal range has to do with the fact that the fetal thyroid is much more sensitive to antithyroid drugs than the maternal thyroid. Um, so we need to relax the treatment targets in women treated for Graves' disease to three to four in the upper third of the normal range. Okay, so um, um, near the end of my talk, um, what I wanted to mention about monitoring in Graves' disease regards also TSH receptor antibodies. 
Because if you go to these two great papers that I mentioned here on my slides, you will find that these meta-analyses show that actually there has not ever been a single case described of fetal or neonatal hyperthyroidism in which the maternal T cell receptor antibody concentration during pregnancy was lower than 3.7 times the upper limit of the normal range of T cell receptor antibodies. And this implicates that if you find a T cell receptor antibody um, of less than three times the upper limit of the normal range in early pregnancy, it's actually not necessary to repeat T cell receptor antibody analyses or to really intensely monitor the fetus for signs of Graves' disease. Um, and on top of that, as I mentioned before already, if you measure it in TSH receptor antibody that's lower than three times the upper limit of normal in early pregnancy, you would also, based on the natural decline of TSH receptor antibodies, expect that the TSH receptor antibody concentrations will go down anyway with pregnancy. So it's very unlikely if it's lower than three times the upper limit of normal in early pregnancy, then it will be above 3.7 times the upper limit of normal during later pregnancy. So here are just some brief conclusions about you know, diagnosing hypothyroidism and how to use the correct reference ranges and how TPO antibody status can help to inform you on whether or not you should treat mild thyroid disease in pregnancy. And that when you do decide to treat mild thyroid dysfunction in pregnancy, to start with a low dose and then try to increase that according to TSH and free T4 measurements. And in women with Graves' disease to try and limit exposure to antithyroid drugs um, with the things that I just mentioned. So preconception counseling is very important as well as titration therapy and also to consider to start, uh, to stop, sorry, a low dose PT or methimazole in early pregnancy if your patient has mild disease. Um, and then the things I just mentioned about the TSH receptor antibodies. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, this was really an update talk. So perhaps I didn't mention very basic things, uh, but I would be more than happy to discuss anything else um, in the next 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, the session is open for discussion. Uh, I see that you can also ask questions in the chat. Maria is about to, uh, to write two questions, but they didn't arrive yet. So please, uh, I see Christina with a microphone uh, as, asking for a question. Please, Christina. Yes. Thanks for this amazing revision about thyroid disease in pregnancy. It, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, since the importance of normal thyroid function in pregnancies and for the fetus, do so you think that whole human and healthy human should be screened for thyroid pathologies during, during pregnancies? And uh, if you, yes, uh, in which moments of pregnancies? Only in the first trimester, also in the near of the, the delivery. What do you think about that? Yeah, this is a very important question, which is still very much debated in this field. Um, so my personal view is that we are not yet ready to start screen, uh, to start screen all women. And the reason for that is that if you would screen women with uh, TSH and 3T4 measurements, for example, about 0.3% of those women will have overt hypothyroidism, so a high TSH and a low 54. Mm -hmm. And I think for those women, you know, every, everyone in the world, every, every expert opinion would be to treat those women. But then, you know, 3.5% of women will have subclinical hypothyroidism. And 2.5% of those women will have isolated hypothyroxinemia. And actually, for those disease entities, we're not yet sure if we should treat all of those women. So that means that for every woman that you identify with a treatment indication of hypothyroidism, you would probably identify 20 to 30 women who have an abnormal thyroid function and you don't really know what to do with. And if you look back at the last 10 years, we have massively overdiagnosed and overtreated women with levothyroxine during pregnancy because we have been using two and a half and three milliunits per liter as the upper limit of TSH um, 
to define whether or not there's an abnormal thyroid function and to start levothyroxine treatment. So 10 years ago, we made a mistake and we started treating all these women and we've probably done a lot of harm with that, with the data that we have now. So we need to be 110% sure before we start to screen everyone and before we start to treat those women as well. And I don't think that we are at the point right now where we can be absolutely certain that who to treat and how to treat these women. So I think there is ways to screen women, uh, but that should be more um, in a, a sort of two-step way of screening women where the lab doesn't give you the T-station free to four concentrations, but just says hypothyroidism, yes or no. Because then you won't find the women that you don't know whether or not to treat, and you will find the women that have hypothyroidism and could require treatment. That will be a way around that. But for now, I think the most important thing is to just gather new data and to reanalyze the data that we have from randomized trials, which is something that we are doing right now, um, in order to say something about which women actually can benefit from treatment. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank you, it's very clear. Yeah. Tim, there is a question here for, on the chat that uh, is the following: For thyroid women that are positive for that have antibodies, what are the risks of iodine supplements? So, in women who? Sorry, you just they are you... thyroid. Yeah, they have uh, antibodies. TPO oh, I see. Positive. TPO. Yeah, yeah. That's that's another difficult question. Um, I think that we shouldn't really, so we can distinguish who has a treatment indication or who doesn't have a treatment indication using the TPO antibodies as a way to stratify. But for you know, iodine deficiency or potential consequences of mild iodine deficiency, there is no way to use the antibodies to stratify. I mean, on one hand, you can say, you know, if you have mild iodine deficiency and TPO antibody positivity, you have a high risk of hypothyroidism. So you may want to have a lower threshold to give iodine. Um, but on the other hand, there's also quite some women who are TPO antibody positive and who actually still have a normal thyroid function. So if a woman still has a normal thyroid function, I don't see a reason to start iodine supplementation. Now, Iodine supplementation can, of course, be pragmatically started because it's quite safe in areas of mild thyroid, uh, sorry, mild iodine deficiency. So I think actually, you know, living in an area where there is mild iodine deficiency is a more important argument to start uh, with iodine supplement than simply having euthyroid TPO antibody positivity. Thank you again. Um, I, I don't see raised hands. I have another question on the chat that is the following. For women with isolated hypothyroxinemia, uh, do you consider that uh, starting um, iodine supplements in, in pregnancy already, do you consider it to be late or too late already? Or, or maybe rephrasing, how early shall we start? <laughs> supplementing yeah. women with iodine yeah well you know because iodine is so safe i don't think that there are any good arguments against starting it in a later stage of pregnancy um i mean there are some data that indicate that the earlier you start the better so we have done some studies looking at prospective cohort studies from the UK and Spain and also the Netherlands and the association of, of iodine in the mother and brain development related outcomes in the child, for example. And there we already saw that having mild uh, iodine deficiency, especially in early pregnancy, much more than in later pregnancy, is associated with light, lower child IQ. And there's an English study who looked at iodine status of the mother before pregnancy and child IQ, finding very large differences of seven IQ points uh, between the women who have iodine deficiency and who had normal iodine. So prefer preferably iodine supplementation should be started before pregnancy because your, your 
thyroid can store iodine for up to three months. But, you know, if you have a reason to start iodine supplementation during pregnancy, even if it's the second or maybe even third trimester, I think you could still do it because it still goes to the child and may benefit thyroid hormone production in the child. But, uh, but Tim, on that, there are also some studies indicating that after the first trimester, the impact is much lower or in some studies none, right? Yes, that's also true. Absolutely. Yeah. Because of the critical window that you just mentioned for development, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's true. That's probably also why we find this uh, in, in the um, cohort studies as well. Um, and, you know, all it, the same thing with, uh, with, with uh, levothyroxine, you know, if a woman becomes hypothyroid at 20 weeks of pregnancy, we don't have any data whether she would benefit from it or whether it, and it would be outside of the window but you know still if there is an indication to start thyroid hormone treatment it would make sense to do it even if it's later than that as long as you make sure that you don't over treat and um, because if you do harm with your treatment that's a reason to not do it of course yes so i'm looking at the window to see if i don't miss any um, hand raised So I have, I have another question. So in terms, I mean, uh, the people in this audience know that we are running the study on following women uh, and trying to see the impact of iodine supplementation and when how early to start. Uh, would you like to comment a little on, on um, what would be the indicators? If you have only a single indicator to look for, as Christina was check, uh, mentioning to check for thyroid function, I'm concerned when I read the data information on how sufficient are the countries. Most of the data comes from child uh, urinary iodine content in, in children. So what is your opinion about uh, monitoring more closely at the population level, the urinary iodine levels of different um, age groups in a population? Specifically, I'm thinking about pregnant, of course, but what is your opinion on yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's always good and important to have good data uh, about these things. And um, you know, in the Netherlands, we we didn't monitor for a very long time because since the 1960s, we've always had fortified salt, and uh, it was also mandatory for bakers to put iodine fortified salt uh, into the bread when they're baking it. So for a very long time. We didn't bother to monitor because we knew that we would probably have sufficient iodine status. But actually, what we found now that there's also a, a, a trend amongst especially young and more highly educated women to eat less bread is that actually iodine uh, status has gone down, and urinary iodine um, excretion data also now show this. Um, so, I, I do think it's important to continue to monitor also because. The population changes and you need to make people aware of the importance of, of, of iodine supplements or other supplements from that point of view. And when you look at how much it actually costs to do such a monitoring study, it's, it's not that difficult uh, to perform or to, to fund it as a government. So I think from that perspective, you know, it, it, it's uh, something that has low costs, but has a potentially very relevant and high gain. Um, and, and another thing is that, you know, you need to be able to um, show the data for certain recommendations. And actually the data that I just mentioned you in the Netherlands has now been incorporated to um, uh, dietary advice that has just come out, which now includes actually that women who want to become pregnant uh, start to uh, think about iodine intake and also use iodine supplements when they use um, folic acid, for example. So you can actually also see here in the Netherlands, and that's very unexpected for us based on what we used to have iodine status wise, that such monitoring can be very relevant um, in terms of communicating to the public what, what can be important from a dietary advice point of view. Right, thank you. And that, that's also uh, a way to convince the governments to monitor not only children, but also 
more susceptible groups of uh, individuals like pregnant women. Yeah. Thank you. So any other questions for, for Tim? I know two o'clock is approaching, but I think there's still... Um, so if not, Tim, I'm sure we will continue our interactions uh, and discussions on these projects. Thank you really very much for giving us this overview. Uh, very clinical oriented, so I'm sure the clinicians will take care of, uh, I mean, obstetricians, Christina and uh, endocrinologists, Maria and others pro certainly uh, got very, oh, Fatima has a question, sorry, Fatima, oh, sh Fatima is clapping, okay, so yeah, yeah, we cannot clap, so thank you really very much for this update, it's going to be very useful, and now people got to know you also, so they can contact you, and hopefully in the fall you you come in person and we we have other opportunities for for chatting thank you very much tim really thank you very much for this great talk all right thank you guys